and welcome to Found in Translation, a weekly-ish exploration of one fellow's translation of the Christian scriptures, one chapter or two at a time. I'm Brandon Rhodes, and across the internet for me is the translator himself, Brandon Johnson. Hi, Brandon. Hey, Brandon. How you doing this lovely morning? Good. I've been excited to get to this episode. Um, there's some fun stuff to talk about. Yeah, and not just stuff you discovered while translating it, but while translating another epistle that made you come back to this. And yeah, I'm excited for this. This is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are talking this week about Romans 12 and 13. I haven't had a chance to read Brandon's translation. For those of you watching, we will have it up on the screen here momentarily. And for those of you listening, uh, there is a link in the uh, show notes so you can read it on litbible.net. This is from Brandon's translation called the Liberation and Inclusion Translation of the New Testament. Uh, and as always, don't skip out on the footnotes. They're pretty good and pretty easy to access uh, on the website as well. So if you need to, hit pause, give it a read. Uh, so this comes after a lot of um, spicy, confusing, misleading, mm -hmm. <laughs> in other translations, mm -hmm. uh, theological Actually, adventures yeah. by Paul. Um and, you know, and like we said, you know, the last episode we did three, three, uh, three chapters at once, uh, nine, ten, and eleven, because it is, to some interpreters, so, something of a pericope, something of like a an aside, a sidebar of like, well, we, I should probably talk about what do we do about Israel instead of a natural part of its flow, and then it gets back to, um, kind of this. It doesn't even get back to it, just sort of decide it's like in their telling of it, of the structure of Romans. The whole thing, there's, there's this turning point on that very first word of Romans 12, 1, therefore. Um, mm -hmm. But often there isn't a sense of like everything that follows 12, 1 flows or has resonance with everything that precedes it. It's like, here's all this weird stuff about how Jesus like dealt with your sins and uh, how weird we is that we still sin and the law makes us feel weird and squiggly and we're all bastards. And therefore, uh, be really nice to each other. And uh, don't remember the government might beat you up if you, if you poke them in the eye and uh, also be a little codependent. It's like, Where'd all this shit come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what was it like getting to 12 here? And um, yeah, tell me about it. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, especially talking through it a bit more too. Like, it's part of the flow, right? Just like we figured, talked about that. It's kind of like uh, two to like four ish are addressing Jews, Jewish Christians about, hey, don't think of yourselves as more important than the Gentile Christians. Don't. Then nine through 11 is kind of like, hey, you're not free, oh, scot free here either. Like Gentiles, don't think of yourselves as better than Jewish Christians either. And then this is like tying it together again. Yeah. 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 And we'll see that as we, as we work our way through. Um, I suppose that really begins with the first verse there, the second word in your translation, family. Mm -hmm. um, this has been an overarching question in Romans is, um, does your family make you better than others or more worthy of God's belonging or whatever does it place you over others um 
I'll say that the word family here places this translation above most others <laughs> because um, mm -hmm. the words behind that, the word behind that has been a source of, boy, when, when people get really righteous about uh, Bible translations, um, it particularly Theobros, it has to do with a translation right here that you just cleanly mm -hmm. sidestepped in a lot of ways while landing on the healthy side yeah. of things. Yeah. So the word is Adelphoi, uh, which has a lot of meanings. <laughs> Uh, there are those, particularly the translators of the ESV, who would who try to claim that it means one thing and one thing only, and they they say it means brothers. So if you look in the dictionary, the lexicon, you probably will see that as like definition number one, right? That's the most common usage of it. But the way languages work that are not English. Like many languages work this way, including Greek and Hebrew, is that there is grammatical gender, not just like actually gender based on like body parts and such. Right. Yeah. And so there isn't a gender neutral word for siblings. It just, whenever there's a mixed group of brothers and sisters, it defaults to the masculine form to refer to siblings. And that's tr not just true of this word, that's true of any word that refers to people of mixed genders, it defaults to the masculine form. Mm. It's true in Spanish, it's true in Hebrew, it's true in a lot of languages. Uh, and so for them to claim this doesn't include sisters and therefore the TNIV, the NRSV, the CEB, these other translations that say brothers and sisters uh, is their translation of this word are wrong. It tells me that they don't understand language. Please. People who don't understand language probably shouldn't be responsible for translating things. In the place that like bias and just cultural difference plays in how you do this work. Like it's not choosing the top word in the lexicon and going with that as like iron and fixed and settled and rigid. Um, mm -hmm. There's much more spaciousness to how really all languages, but yeah, more others than ours, maybe mm -hmm. work like there's, those committed to to monogendering here it's more it's more consequential to monogender in other verses and other places where adolfoy shows up sure. um but to monogender the people of god is it's theologically and socially obtuse but it's also mm -hmm. um yeah, it it's like leaning on cultural um insularity supremacism and blindness to justify some like oh light misogyny uh like yeah it, it's like an intersectional like microaggression it's weird yeah yeah so thanks it's for weird. not stepping into that it's linguistically just not right <laughs> mm -hmm. like this, this word the word adelphoi can be used it, like i said it's literally means like siblings yeah but it can it gets used for cousins it gets used for like fellow people of the same nationality it gets it, like it's it's not such an it's not this narrow word that only has one meaning yeah. And so to translate it more spaciously uh, as family, especially like capital F there really gets at like the mm -hmm. work of the divine in 
Jesus has been to create a new kind of family together that mm -hmm. uh, overcomes uh, or or that is the, that I suppose calls our allegiance in a way that doesn't let us keep. playing the supremacy game yeah yeah in some ways that this word right here is the point of all of romans mm -hmm. is that everyone this letter is addressed to is being called family jewish christians and gentile christians yeah there it is there it is um yeah so let's move on and see how that theme holds further on in uh the chapter Hmm. Actually, as uh, let's get to that. I want to. I want to um, hang out around verse. Let's see. I suppose it's like eight. Is that it? I'm gonna have to do a little bit of light editing here. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, um, it's uh, we had talked about this kind of uh. This section here, eight, like that's it. Yeah. Wanting to do doing things because you actually want to. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, this the sense of sharing because you genuinely want to share. Yeah. Can you Stand can you read these protected. verses and? Oh, sure. Uh, whoever shares something, do so based on genuinely wanting to do so. Whoever stands as a protector, do so based on earnestly wanting to do so. <laughs> whoever shows committed compassion, do so based on being happy to do so. Love must be without pretending. What's how's it? How are those typically translated? Uh, I don't think it's awful. It's more just like I. It was very intentional about drawing it out. Yeah. Uh, so looking at the uh, looking at the NET here, it says uh, if it is contributing, he must do so with sincerity. If it is leadership, he must do so with diligence. If it is showing mercy, he must do so with cheerfulness. Love must be without hypocrisy. Um. Uh, so the wording there to me suggests like you're going to do this so force yourself to be sincere about it. But what I was seeing as I was translating and wanting to word it to draw this out was only do it if it's sincere. So yeah, try to get it to be sincere so that you can do it. But it's not a you're going to do this or else. So be happy about it. Yeah. There, there is a fundamental freedom, like always be checking in. Are you doing this out of obligation? Um, don't stay in the obligation lane for long. Um, mm -hmm. There's always, it's always a sacred invitation, maybe to rest, maybe to the divine stirring mm -hmm. something in a new direction for you um yeah there there there's tr trust that there's something there to to discuss and dis disclose not as a bad thing like confessing sin but um it's there's an honesty that is important mm -hmm. for freedom to be healthy and for yeah. Uh, there is a healthy sense of obligation to one another here. You are your brother's keeper. We are bound up in this sacred web of belonging together. Um, yeah, that really does um, dare us to consider um, whether you're, you've ever been part of a religious order or an intentional community um, a practice-based community, um, hell, a marriage. Um, if you're if you're taking 
vows, even um, the clergy um, in a lot of traditions, you know, um, I work and minister with the uh, United Methodist Church. And for the um, the most like, I guess, severe <laughs> form of calling there is to be an elder. And that's a that's a lifelong vow to serve at the leisure of the bishop. And if the bishop calls you to serve in a new location, which happens regularly, you do. Um, and you made that vow once and you can get out of it. Uh, of course, but I love this bringing this forward, like, Hey, let's check in about that. Like do so, um, out of earnestly desiring to, mm -hmm. and if, yeah. Yeah, I'll, leave, I'll 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 say what I said off air as well that um it's it can be uncomfortable and I know pretty um in tension with a lot of traditions how they hold um the nature of marriage the truth mm -hmm. is sometimes those um very ontological cosmic senses of what marriage is um and sense of like you can't go back on it which there's a lot of good things to be said for all of that there is um mm -hmm. yeah don't leave just at a, on a whim no god no um and a lot of spouses are in abusive marriages because they don't believe because of that way of holding what a vow is um and their religious community would kick them out or um economically they are unable to because of patriarchy it's typically going to be the female in mm -hmm. a hetero relationship for example um they're stuck there and so having this mm -hmm. counterbalance to that very strong sense of protect the bond, protect the vow, having a counterbalance here of are you genuinely free here mm -hmm. to be safe and thriving and truthful, living truthfully, free from abuse and exploitation. I'm riffing pretty strongly on these verses, but I, I, I clearly mm -hmm. love um, putting this counterbalance here in here, particularly especially yeah. given the fact that it's right in between two verses that can easily lend itself to codependence and not actually standing up for yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We should touch on those next. Um, yep. makes, what's making me think is, is it's like kind of the fake it till you make it saying that's kind of arguing against that here. Mm -hmm. um, and never doing anything unless you like are really excited about it like also doesn't quite work that's what commitment is for and so yes. there's this both and quality to this conversation mm -hmm. and anytime there's a both and quality to any two things that are hard to fit together it's messy and it's not always clear exactly what to do with it in every situation. And you have to wrestle with it. So it like, that's part of the deal. Yeah. But. Yeah. And living in trusting that tension is generative is, mm -hmm. is part of how creation works. It's how newness and emerges in this cosmos. And so mm -hmm. living like, look, our religious tradition holds these two things that commitment can be boring and, and worth it. And like, also love must be without pretending and do so in mm -hmm. freedom. And yeah. we're going to trust that the, there is a holy contradiction there that we have to figure out how to like live between mm -hmm. not, not, not as balance, but as, um, I suppose trusting that it, it will birth new wisdom beyond the binary. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like finding some precise middle point and staying there. That, it's no. like wrestling with when do I lean into one side, when do I lean into the other, and they're both appropriate in various mixtures at different times, and we have to figure that out in every single 
scenario it's it's the the desire to have one clear thing that i can just rely on following it precisely every time it makes sense it's a lot simpler yeah and it's not real life it's not real life yeah there's a binding and loosing work of the church here to be constantly discerning what is actually making for human flourishing here beyond even possibly our our settled assumptions a good chunk of this book has been about this letter this sermon has been about don't use your settled assumptions to slap each other <laughs> mm -hmm. yep yeah um stand up for yourself yeah, so so what were you talking about codependence oh yeah let's just like let's talk about verse 16 um okay where it really kind of ramps up uh in your translation you've got it as think of each other as equals not thinking of yourselves as higher but yielding to those of low status do not come to think of yourselves as exceptional um that combined with a couple other verses that Paul has uh, of like, you know, consider the needs of others ahead of your own. And it really lends itself to this inability to listen, to stand up for yourself, to, to do things out mm -hmm. of freedom, love others as you love yourself. You do have to love yourself. Um, it's, there's just a constellation of passages that, I think no matter how you translate it, it's going to be diff it, there. There's going to be some level of slippery slope towards repentance mm -hmm. um, in the way Paul worded it. But um, I I really love what you've done here in like really trying to like grip that put some traction and tread on that slippery slope. Yeah, I mean it's don't think about as yourselves as higher than someone else. Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean you're worthless and everyone else is worthwhile like what that doesn't make sense it, yeah so you're you're equals and sometimes equity requires yielding to those of lower status mm -hmm. to raise them up not to bring yourself down yeah but it's not about abandoning your own needs all the time right mm -hmm. like it's no sometimes postponing your needs for the sake of others but not always that even right it's just it's just not sustainable at that yeah. point yeah put and on your own mask and putting on the mask of those next to you <laughs> right on the airplane yep uh do not come to think of yourselves as exceptional fits so well with the whole rest of this book that we've already looked at it's like yeah, being Jewish is special because you were entrusted with Torah. Great. There's where being the oracles. Gentile yeah. is special because you were grafted in and great. That doesn't mean you're better. And even putting it in the context of this chapter, like it's talking about having different giftings. So having one gift that someone else doesn't have doesn't mean you're better. It just means you have that gift and then they have a different gift. I'm pretty sure. Like it's, it's just <laughs> not, don't use any differences as a way to justify thinking of yourself as better than others. It's just don't do it. Stop. Yeah. They're different. They're real. It, it's not a value judgment. It's just a difference. It's just a fact. Yeah. 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 Particularity is not mean exclusivity. Um, right. Yeah. Reading verse 16, uh, one, reading it socially as much as an exhortation to an individual. Mm -hmm. And particularly reading it through the lens that we've been reading this whole letter. You know, we began this episode recapping the way in which these these therefores these like ethical and social exhortations can feel like non sequiturs to conventional ways of holding romans given the anti supremacist anti sectarian pro 
new kind of belonging in Christ determined by God's love, not by anything, anything else, anything mm-hmm. else. Um, then this just like clicks right into place as, well, of course, when Paul's going to turn the page or spin the scroll, <laughs> uh, Phoebe is, I suppose, is the one reading it, um, to this point of how then shall we live together? Of course, one of the things Paul's going to say is y'all are equals and actively keep that at the front of your mind. And whoever you think of as quote unquote low status, don't think of yourself as above them. Mm-hmm. Don't come to think of yourself, y'all's self as exceptional. Absolutely read that through the lens as an individual. Absolutely. But son of a gun. <laughs> It yeah. makes the whole letter pop and the whole letter mm-hmm. makes that verse pop in a new way. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely both. It's whereas all the other Pauline epistles, well, I think all the other Paul epistles that we've done, whether it's Paul or not, have been addressing y'all consistently. Romans goes kind of goes back and forth mm-hmm. um, more often y'all, but there's several places where it's, the individual form of you yeah Um, it's trying to make sure that both are captured so yeah and and here like even uh, to apply it a bit more in our own context um i think that's a good application it's a good to extend that to denominationalism and Mm -hmm. these um these branches uh these many many branches of the christian tree of faith that are all actually grafted into Israel's story, one. Um, <laughs> two, mm-hmm. we all tend to think of ourselves as like, well, we're the real, we're the real trunk. We're the right. faithful remnant, or we are the ones sitting on Peter's seat, or we are whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, find a way to belong beyond the binaries and bullshit. Um, and you know, that's not to say there aren't real differences and disagreements, but there's a kind of Catholicity here that, um, plays out in neighborhoods very concretely. Yeah. And if there is a hostility about differences, it better not be on your end. Yeah. Which brings us to. Yeah. 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 Rather, if the one who is hostile to you is hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. It's not, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. It, it should not be on your side that the hostility is starting. Nope, 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 nope. Um, well, before we get to 13, there's a little bit more here. Uh, I think you caught another insertion of... Um, Put a God where it doesn't belong. Jerk God into, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Abuse of God in here. So verse 19, for those listening. Yeah. Loved ones, that includes not avenging yourselves. Instead, give anger space, since it is written, carrying out justice is for me to do. I will repay it, says the Lord. Now, like like you mentioned, Brandon, before that, it, I understand why they do it, but every other translation that i looked at which is like six or seven of them except the king james which i keep being surprised by (laughs) appreciating the king james uh adds the word god in there well first they translate anger as wrath which is just archaic english it's update your language for heaven's sake uh and two they add of God. So wrath of God. That's not in the Greek. The word God is not there. Um, so it's usually like instead um, leave wrath to God. Uh, let me give you an example of yeah, please do. the NET here. It's the one I happen to have up. 
So do not avenge yourselves, dear friends, but give place to God's wrath. Shit, okay. For it is written. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of ways to take this, and it doesn't automatically mean it's referring to God's anger here either. It could be. It makes sense. Like, let you could interpret it as like let anger have its proper place in God's hands, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's one way you could take it. I tend to think of it as more of like. kind of like let the anger lie let it not stew but don't try to assuage the anger quickly by getting revenge but let yourself feel it let it sit let it like exist without having to act on it quickly or rashly or at all maybe uh yeah what what stands what's how does it sit with you yeah um you know they've had a hard go uh in in rome um the roman government was not wild about jews or about um christians off and on and uh I can pretty well understand that I can appreciate them saying, wanting to say, you know, these jerks are like martyring us. They're persecuting us. Um, we're worshiping the God of peace here, we're trying to like get along and be nice to each other. And like, they keep on, I can understand how there's a desire for vengeance, a desire for, mm -hmm um them to get theirs at some level um and to stand up for ourselves and like if mm -hmm. if uh if a cop is um berating us then let's let's get them sorry did yeah. i say cop i meant roman centurion <laughs> however uh -huh. did i make uh -huh. that accident uh awkward um all centurions are bastards um <laughs> <laughs> i love how that works <laughs> funny isn't it yeah um, um so we need to defund the centurions um yeah so so i think the i i appreciate paul's like saying step back from a, ven a vengeance disposition but I am not going to tell you not to be angry because mm -hmm. they're treating you like shit. Mm -hmm. They're killing you. Mm -hmm. Be angry. <laughs> and your way of like phrasing the Greek here, um, give anger space. To me, it's like, yeah, let it decant. You do need to metabolize that. You all mm -hmm. need to metabolize anger for what you are going through. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and he says, since it's written, carrying out justice is for me to do. I will repay it. Whatever that means. It doesn't mean, it doesn't actually mean punishment. It doesn't mean I will make them suffer for how you were treated. That's what we think of what justice means. I think that's what I've inherited from. Yeah, but if we're thinking restitutionary, yeah, restorative justice, which is ninety nine percent of the time what the Bible is talking about when it talks about justice. Yes, I will make this right. Mm -hmm. I see what is happening to you, and it has not. <laughs> it has reached my ears. Um. Mm -hmm. So, one of like. I I'm hearing it as metabolize your anger um before and with the god who will make things right and will not leave violence um ignored. Doesn't mean he, god's going to punish. Doesn't mean god's going to send the centurions to hell or Caesar mm -hmm. or whatever. 
Um, I mean, for heaven's sake, if we're all called to be at peace with all, as far as it's up to you, be at peace with all people, I think it's fair to expect that the Christ-like God is going to keep doing that mm-hmm. too. Yeah. This is such a great transition into what we're going to talk about next. And another reminder of how chapter the chapter divisions that we've inherited do harm to our understanding of these things yeah this is not it's like usually it's like chapter 13 is starting a brand new topic completely unrelated yeah it's part of the same flow of thought so like you said rome is harming us and we're angry about it and it's tempting to get revenge to use violence to make force them to stop yeah but if someone is hostile to you and they're hungry feed them if they're thirsty give them something to drink do not be conquered by harmfulness but instead conquer harmfulness with beneficialness to others and then it goes into how do you respond to those with authority to earthly rulers yeah Yeah. they're the ones who are hostile to you that's what it's talking about Mm -hmm. and you have every right to be angry at them and say that they are doing wrong there and you are called to live with love and beneficialness to others regardless of what they're doing yes yeah and so here we get to 13 yeah which is the fun part of today i think yeah yeah so was it one through um it's one through ten kind of really five one through seven it's it's all one flow yeah let's read this that whole one through ten aloud here okay in your translation (laughs) yeah yeah this is my translation yeah Uh, each living being should cooperate with the authorities who arise over them since no authority figure exists without being under god and those that exist are arranged under god therefore whoever is organized in opposition against the authority has risen against god's arrangement and those who rise against it will take on decisive action against themselves. Those who lead are not fearful to those who be- with beneficial actions, but with harmful. Do you want to have no reason to fear the authority? Do what is beneficial, and you will have the authority's approval. They are God's servant for your benefit. But if you do harm, be afraid, for it isn't for nothing that they carry the sword. They are God's servant of injustice with anger against the one who practices harm. Because of this, it is necessary to cooperate, not only because of the anger, but also because of shared understanding. That's also why you complete your tribute payment, because the representative servants of God are those who persevere in this very thing. Give away everything that is owed, tributes to whomever claims a tribute, tax to whoever claims a tax, fear to whoever elicits fear and treating as having value whomever deserves being treated as having value oh nothing to anyone except love to each other whoever loves the other fulfills torah you see the part that says do not engage in marital infidelity do not murder do not steal do not crave and any other directive is summarized with this saying love your neighbor as yourself Love doesn't produce harm to the neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of Torah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah, that's for those of us who are reading this uh, with an anti-authoritarian fundamental understanding of scripture. This has been a sticky one in historically yeah yeah it's used to say like hey god installed governments and the specific leaders over you and 
Christian nationalists have taken that sense of things and said like, hey, how dare you question God's chosen? They only say that when their side is in power and they don't say it about countries that they think we should invade. They didn't say that about Hitler. They didn't say that about Bill Clinton. They didn't say that. They didn't say that about Saddam Hussein. There's hypocrisy. But yeah, it's it's clearly a the legacy of this thing is pretty effed up in mm-hmm. justifying God ordained wielders of violence. Yeah. But there's another way to understand what's happening here. There is. In a, even in addition to what we're already noticing in at the end of 12 that leads into this, right? Um, but I want to read you a bit of uh, Tom Stark's work. This is from an uh, article about Romans 13, 1 to 7 here. For centuries, the ruling elites and their systems of domination have found an ally in these ostensibly unambiguous words from the mouth of the Apostle Paul. As Robert Jewett puts it, Romans 13, 1-7 has provided the basis for propaganda by which the policies of Mars and Jupiter have frequently been disguised as serving the cause of Christ. Conversely, and not surprisingly, many liberation theologians theologians have found something of an adversary in Paul in their attempts to construct theologies of revolutionary social change. Franz Hinkelammert is representative here when he concludes that Paul is not interested in inquiring about the nature of the existing authority or class structure. For Hinkelammert, Paul knows only that Authorities are necessary. Paul makes no effort to ask whether a particular authority has been established by God or not. The issue is not one kind of authority or another. All authority has been established by God, end quote. This divinely established authority is not any one particular authority, but, quote, authority as such. Since authority as such is divinely established, every authority is divinely established, whether that authority be just or unjust, benevolent or tyrannical. In Paul, according to Hinkelammert, there is no functional distinction. There is for Paul, quote, no Christian political thought dealing with domination, end quote. Mm -hmm. So that's his opening statement and then I skipped a couple of paragraphs here, but this is what he says that he is going to explore as is what he thinks is actually going on here. In this essay, I will challenge readings of Paul, such as Hinkelheimert's. It is my contention that the anthropological work of James C. Scott has provided a new and appropriate lens through which to read texts such as Romans 13, 1 through 7, and that this lens will prove useful for liberation theologians who wish to use Paul in service of theologies of revolutionary social change. The main lines of Scott's observations are as follows. In political economies marked by inequitable power relations, such as in systems of chattel slavery or under colonization, the norm is for the political discourse of the dominated to dissemble that is, to feign obedience and loyalty to the colonial overlords while pursuing its own hidden agenda. On the surface of such an economy, there is what Scott has called the public transcript, which represents the official interpretation of political events and power relations engineered and controlled by the ruling elites. Invariably, Eddying beneath the surface of such an economy, there is also the hidden transcript, a clandestine discourse produced by the subjects of domination. The public transcript is a shorthand way of describing the open interaction between subordinates and those who dominate, whereas the hidden transcript is the discourse that takes place offstage, 
beyond direct observation of power holders. By different, put differently, the public on stage transcript presents the represents the self portrait of dominant elites as they would have seen themselves. While the hidden off stage transcript is the discourse of the oppressed and reflects their true attitude toward their rulers. The word of the dude. The word of <laughs> Tom Stark. <laughs> Thanks be to Iron Man or Stark. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. What a great excerpt. So, what was? The, yeah, and it keeps that... going. It's so many pages long. Our journal article, but but that's the that's the main idea. That basically, so what I'm hearing is um, using uh, James C. E. Scott's work. Um, yeah, which you were Robins, holding up while I was reading there. Yeah, yeah. Here's you know when I, I read that in college, it's a great book. Um, Focus domination and the arts of resistance. Yeah. Hidden transcripts. Yeah, great book. Um, the gist of what he's of what they're saying is that Romans thirteen is um, saying some things in a way that is framed how the dominators would like to see have themselves be seen mm -hmm. but there is a subtext either completely hidden beneath the surface or sort of like well like in the metaphor of like the surface of water the light hits it just right and you can see the real thing going on beneath mm -hmm. yeah which jesus did constantly let's he talks about that's why i'm speaking in parables let, let those who have ears hear, right? Like that's, it's his cue to like, there's a hidden meaning if you're paying attention um, or let the reader understand some of the biblical authors right in the gospels. Like yeah. there's this clue to, I'm not saying it explicitly, but I hope you catch what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah. And you read this passage within the wider context of like, enemy love and a different kind of family i mean well the roman empire was the family of caesar descended of god son of god who has made a new yeah. kind of belonging and roman peace at the end of a sword that is to include right. and encompass all other eth all ethnicities unto itself um and if you don't mm -hmm. like that you can go to hell or gehenna um yeah yeah, you mentioned Son of God there, which is literally uh, one of the self-proclaimed titles of Caesar. It was like on the coin, uh, yeah. Yeah, as Julius Caesar proclaimed himself God, and then so Augustus Caesar, Caesar, his son, and those afterward called themselves Son of God. Yes, yes. So if this whole letter is talking about a new kind of family that is encompassing all other differences in one new kind of peace from the one Lord of the world. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That sounds familiar. Right. Like those guys yeah. with the Eagles. Right. But it was literally very dangerous to say these things out loud to say it as starkly <laughs> as yeah. nt wright does mm -hmm. uh he he's uh summarizes the basic message of the of the early church as jesus is lord and caesar is not yeah nt wright can say that because there isn't a caesar to send some centurions over to murder him mm -hmm. paul was trying not to die <laughs> yeah and yeah martyrdom is not a goal say it like that you know. So, if we're acknowledging that there are people who cause harm, people who are hostile to us, and our job is to love them, going immediately into, again, when Paul wrote this, there were no chapter divisions, there were no verse numbers, there were not there were no paragraph breaks, no sentence punctuation, not even spaces between the words. This is all one unbroken block of text. Right. There, was, there was no cue to look away and then come back later uh, between mm -hmm. these chapters. This is continued flow of thought. 
Let me uh, pull, read some of this stuff side by side with the ESV. Oh, man. I was feeling so good <laughs> about my day. I know. I have to shower now. <laughs> no, first one. ESV. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Compared to the LIT here, each living being should cooperate with the authorities who arise over them, since no authority figure exists without being under God, not from God. Mm -hmm. And those that exist are arranged under God, not instituted by God. And you've got good footnotes for every single one of those mm -hmm. uh, shifts there. Yeah. Like, this is what the Greek is saying. It's not just trying to soften it because we know that, you know, when the Bible seems to disagree, let Jesus be the referee, and therefore we're going <laughs> to bend a note or two. Mm -hmm. It's like, literally, the Greek is, this is more faithful to both the yeah. Greek and to the Jew pieces. Right. And there is some ambiguity with the prepositions for instance so like being under god could be translated as being by god mm -hmm. like i don't know that from is one of the options actually so esv taking it as from is weird but um but yeah to say that in the roman empire to say that no human authority exists except under god caesar would not have liked that right but there's this like plausible deniability because you could say it's except by god so yeah instituted by god that's sure if that's how you want to hear what i'm saying caesar go for it yeah yeah he's providing cover if 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 some if word gets out about the um the way Christian, the Christian imagination holds r the rulers, in this case, Caesar. This is sort of a cover your ass clause. Mm -hmm. Framed in such a way to have just enough covering of these. <laughs> right. While also still like putting in there like, mm, but you're still under God. Right, right. And yeah, the decisive action that's coming against yourselves is from the authorities, not from God here. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to have no reason to fear the authority? Don't piss them off. Do what is beneficial. Do what is beneficial. If you look back at the end of chapter 12, do not be conquered by harmfulness, but instead conquer harmfulness with beneficialness to others. Yeah. This is the way to beat Caesar. Not how you'd expect. And that's bringing... But I can't say that directly. No. No. But it is actually an expression of the kind of lordship Christ has. It's an expression right. of like, right. what does it mean for Christ, for Jesus to be Lord? Well, it means that extending justice to the world looks like beneficialness for all people, not... Right carceral punitive punishment right it's because christ was violence. victorious not in spite of the cross but because of the cross through, through, through the through. cross yeah yep yeah 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 so we're 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 not dialing into all of these little linguistic th things here in this episode um but at a broad yeah. level, that's kind of how we're making sense of this. Yeah, lots of little shifts like that. I do want to nod it to the end of five where oh, it's yeah. talking about because of this, it is necessary to cooperate. Not only because of the anger, but also because of shared understanding. Hmm. It's like wink, wink, because of what we we understand what we're talking about here, right, guys? Yeah. <laughs> We're all on the um, same page here. They're still being dicks. Yeah. And we're not going to jab them. Yeah. 
So and then it it comes to this big flourish here in six through ten. Mm-hmm. It lands in a very groovy way. Yeah. So it's like saying not only don't rise up with violence against them, but if they want you to pay them a tribute, do it. If they want you to pay a tax, do it. Uh, don't fight it. Uh, in fact, they want you to be afraid of them. Sure. Show them some fear. Are you saying the American well, revolutionaries he... refusing to pay taxes to the monarchy was wrong? I, I'm i not <laughs> saying that, Brandon. One does not say that. But there is a shared understanding. We have a shared understanding. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. nothing to anyone except love to each other. Whoever loves the other fulfills Torah. You see the part that says, do not engage in marital infidelity, do not murder, do not steal, do not crave, or any other directive is summarized with this saying, love your neighbor as yourself. It occurs to me that Jesus' explanation of who is my neighbor mm-hmm. was to give an example of a foreigner. Yeah. Um, there's more they could say about that, but I'm just going to throw Clement that in there. To the promises of Abraham. Yep. Right. Yep. Love doesn't produce harm to the neighbor. And a little jab at Caesar there. Mm-hmm. Um, as well as if you're harming even those who harm you, you're not doing love. You're tough not loving love. Your enemy. No, I'm just extending tough love to people in the LGBTQ yeah. lifestyle. No, yeah. you're fucking harming them. They're killing right. themselves and you're empowering other people to kill them. So stop. That's not love. Yeah. And more specifically, even in this context, it's the Jesus says, love your enemy. And I'm not going to say enemy, I'm going to say neighbor, Mm -hmm. but uh, (laughs) you know what I'm talking about. Because Therefore, love is the fulfillment of Torah. Hmm. Which brings it all together from like all this Torah stuff. The whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And then it it just kind of goes on there. Like, yeah, it keeps going. Our liberation is near. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, take take some time to um, explore really both of these chapters in in Brandon's translation because um, it really does escalate the sense of like we are waking up from the grave that has been identities rooted in alienation and violence and coming to a belonging grounded in faithfulness freely embraced and seeking the goodness of others that has been Mm -hmm. born in us through the life breath of Christ Jesus. Like let's effing go. (laughs) Like it's Mm -hmm. a, it's a great like final sprint to uh, (laughs) the the kind of outro, which is probably means I need to get to our outro here. Um, (laughs) (laughs) There you go. That's Perfect. it. Yeah. So thank you as always for joining us for this leg of the journey. The easiest way to support Found in Translation is to leave us a rating or review on whatever app or player you've enjoying been enjoying this on, whether that's Facebook or YouTube or particularly Apple Podcasts and Spotify. That helps all the robots to know to tell more of the humans about it. Um you can find us on Facebook as Found in Translation. You can read the Liberation and Inclusion Translation at litbible.net and follow its development on threads as at lit.bible uh, or find it on Facebook. You can follow Brandon Johnson on threads as at Old Song New Dance and read more of his work at oldsongnewdance.com. You can follow me on threads as at B D R H O D E S. The music you're listening to is by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Found in Translation was produced by Perry FM on Unseated Chinook and Kalapuya Land. 
Goodbye, Brandon. Bye, Brandon. Bye, everybody. Thank you.